Welcome to this God-inspired message from Shofar Christian Church. Enjoy today's message. May you experience the presence of our Father and may you grow deeper in your relationship with Him. It's my privilege to um, introduce Kobus. Kobus Kutsia is one of the leaders in church, uh, a friend of mine, and he's going to be sharing with us this evening. Uh, Kobus is the husband of one wife, Wilma, and they have uh, three children and another one on the way, Prestiere, yeah, Bodhi Nasi. And uh, yeah, so what a, what a blessing. Um, known Kobus about six years or so, and uh, he's been such a blessing to me personally. Uh, he's been a great encouragement to me, and uh, yeah, the Lord has really gifted him uh, prophetically in a bunch of different ways, and um, uh, what I really appreciate about him, I said it this morning, that he's really authentic in the way that he follows Christ. Uh, he's not afraid to face difficult things uh, in his pursuit of, of obedience to the Word of God, and uh, yeah, so you're yeah, really expectant what God wants to share. So let's open our hearts and let's, yeah, let's just pray briefly. Gubis. Father, we thank you that Gubis is such a blessing to us as a church family. We're receiving as that gift this evening. We thank you for the word that you've laid on his heart. And we open up our, our hearts, we open up our lives for what you want to do through him this evening. Let your name be exalted in this place, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you. Thanks, Yaku. Appreciate it. Good evening, church. Um, it's my privilege. It's the first time in, since before COVID that I was at an evening service. So it's my privilege to be here. Um, since I've been married, um, obviously with kids, it makes it difficult to get here in the evenings. Um, now with a baby as well, it's sleeping time. Yep, it's sleeping. Probably woke up already for, for a first nurse. But anyway, my wife is doing that job now. But it's a, such a privilege to be here and bringing the message this evening to you guys. Um, yeah, like like it says, my two boys are actually behind me. They're playing games, so please forgive them for playing games, but it's Sunday night. Right, tonight we're going to talk about something that I believe God put on my heart in January through a vision. While we were at church, God spoke to me about Christ the Bridge. He spoke to me directly, and he wanted to, me to share it with the church, and hence, here I am. But I love the way that Philip also put it, that you can't just share sometimes a vision with, with a church. There must be some substance at the back of it, and hence, here's a sermon. <laughs> so, so bear with me that God really wants Shofar to be bridge builders. Bridges stretching from close, close by to far off. Now, when I say, we, we like to say in Afrikaans and English, build a bridge and get over it, right? We need to build bridges with each other, right? So this concept that God is really talking to me and specifically spoke to me about because it's something that I'm not good in. I've also preached this morning. I felt more comfortable in it, but <clears throat> I'm not there yet. And I think as we go through the sermon, we're really going to challenge ourselves and see what Christ did eventually to be a bridge builder. But <laughs> the thing with bridges is most of the time we like to blow them up, right? Can we have that next slide? I just want to bring that. It's sometimes very, very spectacular, right? We like to, <laughs> we sometimes, let's be honest, then campers of the at work, when there's a huge fight, you like to sit there on the sidelines, it's like, ooh, this is going somewhere, and this is excellent. Ooh. Now, let's be honest about it. Let's, let's just bring, bring that sin in the open, okay? Thank you. And let's continue, because this is what it is about, is... Instead of building bridges, we don't care about those bridges. We let them explode, demolished, just like that. It's quite spectacular. I thought I will give you a bigger bridge, but I mean, 
that will do. What we do miss is the trauma, hurt, and pain after a bridge was blown up. Many of you sitting here tonight know exactly what I'm talking about. A friendship, relationship, even with your parents. Though that fight that evening, you were very, very in front of it. And I mean, I was in fights as well. I know what I'm talking about. That you're in front of it, you think you're really making a point, and you're really demolishing this bridge, and you're enjoying every moment of it, and you afterwards you realize that you are falling in this abyss of trauma, hurt, and pain. Now, it not only manifests in relationships, it manifests as well in countries, different ethnic groups, cultures, and even race. I don't even have to talk about that because we can see it today in Ukraine and Russia. If you're a Russian in Europe, people don't like you much. They don't want you there. If you're a Russian in Ukraine, not a good idea. If you're a Ukrainian in Russia, not a good idea. There is some serious stuff going on because they're really building, <laughs> burning bridges. They're blowing it really up physically as well. And it's strange how the world works. A few years back when I went to the army in the UK, they were still talking about the Jerrys. That's not the Germans that bombed Britain. And they were still angry with them. And it's like, no bridge. Yeah, you see, that bridge has been building, uh, burnt. Now Germany is good. And things change every day. And that was just my introduction. So I want us to look at our bridges today. Our bridges in our lives. That's where I want to focus on. We're going to focus on our next slide. When Jesus said, a two demolished bridges. This is my sermon today. So read with me John 4 verse 4 to 5. Uh, to f John 4 verse 4 to 6. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Shikar, near the plot of the ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Now many people would look at the scripture and say, oh, that's nice. Jesus was thirsty, and, um, and it was warm, so he needed something to drink. But he knew where he was sitting. It was a specific well. It wasn't any well. It was Jacob's well. And now, you, you have to bear with me tonight because there happened something in the past when Jesus sat there. Things happened in the past. And things are happening in the future and present at, him, at his feet at that moment. So it's, you need to bear with me around this. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at a first bridge that happened in the past that was blown up. So at that same well, a bridge was blown up. So, bridge one. Let's read. Wait before we read. Yeah, just show the scripture. Now Dina, the daughter of Leah, had born to Jacob. All right, just stop here. Who's Jacob? Jace, Jacob. Stole, Jacob had a brother called Esau. Okay. And they were the sons of Isaac, the promised son that Abraham had. In other words, Jacob's grandfather was Father Abraham. All right. So he had this daughter called Dina. And you will read in the Scripture only twice about her. To be in the Scriptures is kind of important. I just want to say that. If, if it's in the Scripture, it means God is telling us something. And here God is telling us something because Jesus sat at that well where this happened. When Shechem's son of Hamor, the Hivite, the ruler of that area, saw her, he took her and raped her. His heart was drawn to Dinah, daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. That's now after he raped her, he spoke tenderly to her. Say, so, okay, well, I'm not sure how he's doing relationship building, but that's not how you do relationship building. And Shechem said to his father, Hamor, get me this girl as my wife. When Jacob heard that his daughter Dinah had been defiled, 
His sons were in the field with his livestock, so he did nothing about it until they came home. So here's a bridge that was totally demolished. There, close to that well. Dina got raped by a guy who actually thought he loved her. Not sure how that works. And this is kind of a serious thing that happened here. A total bridge that collapsed. And the, what makes it worse in this passage is that the dad stayed quiet about it. I'm going to let that one sink in. What happened, three, what happened thereafter when their brothers came back? So now I'm at part two. Three days later, okay, so remember now in part one, Shechem wanted to marry Dina. So when the sons returned and they heard what happened, they told their dad it's a good idea that they can get married, but everybody, every male in that city must get them get circumcised. So every male got circumcised in that town. So that's why it says three days later after I put in after circumcision, while all of them were still in pain, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brothers, took their swords and attacked the unsuspecting city, killing every male. They took Hamor, they put Hamor and his son Shechem to the sword and took Dina from Shechem's house and left. The sons of Jacob came upon the dead bodies and looted the city where their sister had been defiled. This is absolute revenge. Right? This is also not how, that's so typical of us humans. He did a bad thing, we got to do this. You know, we, it's, a, it's a culture, almost a human being thing. She did this to me, I'm going to do this. These guys really planned it. It's not that they haven't planned it. It was that they really planned it, how to kill every male in a city. In revenge. We will see how Jesus do this. But here's a very interesting thing. When we look at part three, then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble to me on making me obnoxious to the Canaanites and Perizzites, the people living in this land. We are a few in number, and if you join forces against me and attack me, I and my household will be destroyed. But Ray replied, should we have treated our sister like a prostitute? So according to Jacob and their sons, there was two options. One, Jacob's option, diplomacy. It's okay, you rape my daughter, that's fine. Okay, now marry, that's a good thing. Now we all live in peace, ain't this a good idea? That was Jacob's suggestion to, the, to solve the problem, diplomacy. The brothers was revenge. Now if you talk about bridges, they burned the bridge, and that's why they had, so shortly after this, they had to move out. And that's why Joseph got the land later. Only when Jacob arrived in Egypt again, jo Joseph got that land. <laughs> Jacob never saw that land again. Let's have a look at Dina. How she must have felt the trauma of Dina. Who knows what happened, what went through her mind? The dark abyss of thought. The guilt. Many rape, people that got raped feel guilty. It feels like it's their fault. It's not. The offense, the unforgiveness, and the bitterness. And then how it grew and probably grew in herself because she probably felt lonely and she was broken inside. That search for joy. Then obviously the lack of a father's love because where was Jacob's love there? This is a really messed up story using this language. It's messed up. This poor woman, actually girl, only had a desire for healing and restoration. Somebody telling her, listen, you'll be okay. 
And it's quite interesting how we as human react. Because after this, we read that we don't know if she ever married. But, but we saw that she traveled with Jacob to Joseph in Egypt. But no mention of a husband, nothing. And I believe that's a bit of a clue of what was happening in her life. And then obviously the value of being a woman was attacked. She was degraded to nothing. And then thereafter saying, I actually love him. I don't know what that means. So let's look at another bridge that God demolished of another woman. Yeah, it's not Women's Month, but it's awesome because God really speaks to all of us through women tonight. The trauma of the Samaritan woman. So you'll see that I'll take that John 4, and I took it, and I took verse for verse for verse to basically explain what went through the heart and mind of that woman. When, John 4, verse 7 to 9, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate for Samaritan, with Samaritans. Let's see. There's two things that even happened here. She mentions, I'm a Samaritan woman and I'm a I'm a Samaritan, and I'm a woman. The issue of race or cultural group immediately was brought to the front. I am a Samaritan. Identity check. Dude, you want to talk to me? You see what's going on here? She immediately felt less of value. I'm a Samaritan. You, you can't talk to me. A few years ago, when it was still apartheid, probably the same. You're black, I'm white, you're not talking to me. Now there's more chaos than ever before as well, because how many different groups still struggle to talk to each other? You, you, you don't mingle with us. You, you stay away. We, we do this, you do that. There's no bridges. We like to show the difference. And then we take that difference and then we make it our own. And say, this is who I am. This is now my identity. I'm a Samaritan woman. I'm a Samaritan. That's who I am. That's my identity. No, that's not. That's a belonging of a group. But it doesn't mean that's your identity. And this is a very, very important point. The second thing that she did, she said, I'm a woman. So there's a question of value, just like dinner. It's a serious question of value. How much she felt? How did she feel? Why am a woman? Why are you talking to me? Why, what, what's wrong? I mean, you can't talk to me. And how many times you feel exactly the same? Just like that Samaritan woman. You can be a Samaritan man as well, dude. My value has been diminished because of my sin, because of my cultural belonging, because of a lot of other things. Let's continue with the Samaritan woman. Then Jesus said, in John 4, verse 16 to 18, He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. So, here's a very interesting thing. In terms of, Jesus just said, this is you. Okay? Now, if you had five husbands, what does it tell you about you? If I had five wives, what did it, does it tell me about me? Luckily, I don't. I won't make it. <laughs> One is enough. <laughs> Thank you. Love her dearly. But the pain 
of unfulfilled relationships is present in her life. How many of you are sitting here actually with that same pain? The pain of unfulfilled relationships, knowing that my relationships with other people, with other men, with my parents, is unfulfilled. It's stretched wider. The feeling of shame, guilt, and anger. Here we are back with Dina. Yeah. Dina also felt the same. This feelings of, I almost want to say, I'm less of a value again, coming through. So what did Jesus do? Let's look at Jesus, the ultimate bridge builder, because Jesus is building the bridge here. Jesus knows what she must go through. She knows what she must feel. She knows, he knows everything about her. And let's see how Jesus is building a bridge. How oh, he's moving. So Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, who is it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Here Jesus is actually touching upon the restoration, and she knew it. She knew that water, but she didn't want to believe it. Because the next verse, she says, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? So she wanted to be a bit more rational about it. She wanted to do something out of the flesh. Jesus didn't say, she knew what Jesus meant, but she thought, well, what must I do again? Must I call my brothers to, for revenge? What must I do? Jesus answered, anyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So let's look. Here, Jesus revisits the trauma of at the well. Dina in the past, the Samaritan woman at his feet. Promising healing and restoration. Jesus is building a bridge to the pain, to the trauma, to the hurt, what she's feeling. So let's see what happened further. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. So she admits that he is something. But then Jesus said, Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. Your salvation, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must be worshipped in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I am the one speaking to you. I am he. So something that jumps out of this story is... The Samaritan woman was waiting for the Messiah, even in her sin, even in her brokenness. She was waiting for this restoration. And then Jesus spoke. And they knew, she knew what was going to happen to, the, to, to, to Jesus. She knew that he's going to be an ultimate sacrifice. She knew she's speaking to the guy who is going to die for her. Yes, the Samaritans was a Jewish sect. Okay, So that's how... They knew what Jesus was going to go through. All right. The victorious Jesus, she also knew that he's going to be victorious above her pain and her sorrow. She knew it. Because she knew the scriptures. Even though she had five husbands, even though she had ashamed, she knew it. She knew that what he's bringing to the table is what she needs. And what is so awesome about what she did was a multi multitude, a bridge of a multitude is restored. It restored a bridge between two religious sects. 
Jews and Samaritans. It's quite awesome. Why do I say that? Well, in verse 39, you'll read, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. Okay, so he stayed two days in a community he was not allowed to stay in. The community didn't want him. But Jesus built the bridge so he could stay there. Um, I want to say something. If you want to throw a rock at me, that's fine. I'm just going to stay here something. Um, I'm still waiting for those bridge builders to Urania. I'm just saying. Anyway, and because of his words, many more became believers. They say, they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. So, Jesus went from himself, and he built a bridge. He knew he was a Jew. He knew he was not allowed to talk to the Samaritans, and the Samaritans knew exactly the same. There was this gentleman's agreement. We're not talking to each other. We're not mingling, all right? And what did he do? He mingled. What did he do? He went out of, I wouldn't say his comfort zone. It was definitely out of the disciples' comfort zone. Because Jesus loves everyone. He don't see the difference. So here's the challenge of a new bridge that I want to leave you with tonight. There's a challenge that I believe Jesus has given us. And if you really think about it, it says in Isaiah 61 verse 1 to 4, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. This is Jesus. But you also have a responsibility to go out and proclaim that same good news. And I use the Old Testament in this case and not the New Testament because even the Old Testament said, we need to go out. Hmm? Nice, huh? Bible school. No, not really. So the challenge of the new bridge are talking about Christ the filter. So if Christ is the one that is your filter, when I look at you, or I look at you, or I look at you, or I look at everybody, which is difficult because I'm human, I have to look at you through the lens of Christ, knowing that we can build a bridge, even though I don't like your face, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. It's okay. There's a lot of people that have issues around, I don't like your face, I don't want to be friends. That's a different issue. I'm not going to talk about that tonight. But the fact of the matter is, I can build a bridge with you. No matter who you are, I can build a bridge with you. If I look at you through Jesus' eyes. And there's, there was this pastor from Shofar that said, I don't like, I don't like my daughter. <laughs> okay. He says he just don't like her because everything she does irritates me. <laughs> which is kind of honest, okay? But when he realized that he just had to love his daughter, it made things better. And it makes it easier for him to, when he start looking at his daughter through the eyes of Jesus, then all these irritations passed away. When you start looking at someone else at your work, where you study, at home, wherever, it makes it easier. That brings me to the prophetic church. It's a church that is in action. A church that is moving to touch other communities. To touch your friends in campus. To touch your work, workforce. Now look, I must be honest. Some of you are getting it right. I don't. That touching to other, that bridge building to other people in your community. Where you study. Where you work. For me, it's very difficult. I mean, it's easier to make jokes, you know. Hey, Choma, how's it going? Oh, laka, laka. It's easier doing that than saying, no, really, how's it going? 
And when I did missionary work in China, uh, in Russia, a few years back, that is actually how they do missionary work. Through connecting, building a bridge. Not through spreading the gospel, they're not allowed to. They're allowed to spread the gospel through action. Through, listen, I'm connecting with you. Let's build this bridge. This is what God is doing in my life. I don't know what you believe, but this is what I believe, and this is what happened to me. That's legal. And I can tell you that church is growing there. I get updates of those churches there, and it's amazing. They're growing, and there's miracles happening, and God is moving there powerfully without people going, "Uh, do you know Jesus? Nobody's doing that. Nobody's doing that. Just by building a bridge. So I'm going to use the example of a friend. And I'm going to close with that example. As a friend of mine, he died two years ago of cancer. But he had a passion of building bridges. When you phone him, he's in Turkey. What are you doing in Turkey? No, I'm busy with prayer walks. The Turkey's uh, special forces or whatever, the secret agents are following him. He's going to churches there, encouraging the churches. I said, oh, wow, why would you do that? No, no, building bridges. Phone him. No, I'm in Japan. What are you doing? No, prayer walking. Where are you staying? I don't know. With this couple, friends, people, I don't know. I'm just building bridges. What? So I'm going to bring him a bit closer to home. So just before he died, he heard of a big ANC rally and there in, um, close to Nelspruit. And he decided, well, God's talking to him. So he went and he put on khaki pants, khaki shirt, khaki socks, and put in his fellies. And he climbed in his bucky and he drove with his bucky to this rally. The first thing he did when he climbed out was he bought, bought some chicken and he bought more than chicken. He was eating the chicken and while he was walking, he was talking and he was giving chicken and he was talking. The people said, what are you doing here? This is an ANC rally. He said, I'm building bridges. I want to show you that I'm not, we're not bad people. I want to meet you where you are. That is what I was doing here. I'm here to meet you where you are. You don't have to meet me, but let's just eat chicken. So we all eat chicken and they're all happy. And he left there with a smile and nobody killed nobody and everybody was happy because why? He was building a bridge. And this is my challenge today and tonight for you. To be this bridge builder. I can believe here where I'm standing is a Samaritan woman also was a bridge builder. After she met Jesus, she was a bridge builder. Because she already brought a lot of people from the town to Jesus. She's a bridge builder. But she had to go and sort out the bridges in her own life first. Hmm? Those bombed bridges, she had to face those bridges. Those bridges that that the enemy came and stole and blew up. And there's people sitting here tonight that I do know that have heard of bridges that collapsed, that was blown up. You still sit there with the ruins of those bridges. Maybe it's a relationship of your father, your mother, family member, a friend, husband, whatever. Some of you are sitting here tonight with those pain, that trauma, the trauma of Dina, and the trauma of the Samaritan woman. And tonight, I'm going to give that opportunity that we can deal with that. Some of you are sitting here with this fear of building the bridge. Some of you are sitting here with this, but I can't build a bridge. I'm not a bridge builder. I don't build. Yes, you do build. You can build. If you really want to, if you really look through your environment through Christ's eyes, you will build a bridge. 
But I am there where you are, possibly afraid, possibly insecure, possibly afraid that what people are going to say. Maybe they're going to smack them with a baseball bat over their head. I don't know. But tonight I'm going to ask you for boldness to move in. So if you can stand with me. So our Lord Jesus, we just say thank you. Thank you that we know that you are the ultimate bridge builder. You are the one that connects us to other people, to other countries, to other yeah, to, just to my neighbor, just to my fellow family members. Thank you, Lord God, that we can see that you are working in our lives as well, Lord God, to, to move us into becoming a bridge builder like you. And I just pray, Lord God, for that strength and that courage to be a bridge builder. Now, I just feel like there's some people here that, that have hurt and trauma of previous bridges that was demolished. And I want you to do a bold thing. You don't have to move now. But if you can move now, it will be great. Come and stand here on my left-hand side, your right-hand side. I will specifically pray for you tonight for those bridges that was destroyed and demolished. That God really can come and put his hand on those bridges. That, that God build the bridge, rebuild a bridge. It's, it's, it, I know it's tough, it's difficult. But I really want to encourage you, come stand on my left hand side, if you want us to pray for those demolished bridges. The second thing, come stand here in the middle. I want to invite you to the middle that we can pray with you. If you know that you struggle to be a good bridge builder. You struggle with being, talking to people and building bridges and meeting them there where they are. Not where you are, but where they are. I want to invite you to come and stand in front that we can minister with you and pray with you so that we can all know that when you move out that you, know, that you will become a bridge builder for Christ. Then the third group, I want to stand here on my right-hand side. So if you haven't meet, met Jesus as your Savior, if you haven't met this bridge builder that I was talking about, I want to give you this opportunity to come and stand here and meet Jesus and also become a bridge builder in your community and around us. Thanks, Corvus. Let's just tell, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this evening. Thank you, Lord, that you we speak into our hearts, Lord. We thank you that you, are, you meet each one of us where we're at. I just want to add to Corvus just said, if, if you're in that third group, um, I just also felt that there's some of us here that you, for some reason, Stuff has happened, and on the surface, everything is kind of all right in, in your relationship with the Lord. But deep down, you, f you feel far from Him for some reason. Um, I just feel that this evening He's extending His hand towards you, and He's drawing you close to Him again. But you need to take His hand. You need to walk across that bridge that is Christ. Um, so for, from, for some reason, you feel far from him tonight and I just oh, I want to encourage you to respond to his invitation to come close to him again you know, just as we as we're going to pray for people now if you've for any in any of those groups and if you I want to ask you to be very bold to step out to the front 
that we can pray for you. Um, we do this because it's a, it's a response to what the Holy Spirit is doing in our hearts. I mean, I know it's bold and I know it's challenging, but we do this to say, Lord, this is me and I'm, I'm actually I'm responding to what you are saying to me. So if there's anybody that feels that they need to come to the front, please come. We would love to pray with you. Um, just going to give you a moment or two. And then specifically also, uh, if you feel in this some area of your life where you feel far from God, I'd also like to pray with you. Okay. Cool stuff. Yeah, come forward, guys, if you need prayer. I'd like to pray with you. Yeah, be bold. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is doing something in your heart. Um, please be bold to respond. Amen. That's great. Thanks, guys. Appreciate that. Awesome. Amazing. All right. If you need, if there's any other prayer needs besides what we've talked about, please also be bold. Um, whatever your need is, I might not have an answer for you, but I know God has made a way. Amen. I know He's already made provision for you through the cross. And it'll be our privilege to pray with you. So I'm going to close now, but I want to really encourage you if, if, if you still need to come to the front, um, all you're doing basically is saying, yes, God, I need you. <laughs> you're not saying anything to us. You're just responding to what the Holy Spirit is saying. You're saying, Lord, I need you in this area of my life. Okay, so please be bold. Lord, I thank you. Thank you for each person here. And thank you for your word, Lord. I thank you that you love each one of us. And I just sense, oh, there's some here that are struggling to believe that right now. But I thank you that you as the Father tonight open the heavens again and say, you are my beloved. And I am well pleased with you. Through the blood of my son, I've, bought the, I've paid the price so that you are acceptable before the Father. And oh, we thank you for that, Lord. And I thank you that you minister to each one right now. And I thank you, Lord, that this word that we've heard tonight, that it will take root in our hearts in the name of Jesus, that we as individuals, but also as a church family, that we would, that you'd stir our hearts with compassion, Lord, like you did with Jesus and towards that Samaritan lady, Lord, that you would stir our hearts, Lord, that we would recognize the brokenness around us, that you would recognize every place where you've put us, where you've put us, that we can be Christ's bridge that we can let the Christ literally can be the bridge through our lives Lord in Jesus name Lord so we pray that you stir us with compassion and with boldness Lord to invite people with boldness to pray for people with boldness to love people in Jesus name and we thank you Lord we ask that you be good fruit of this Lord in our lives and through our lives Lord in Jesus name let your kingdom come Lord in Jesus name I pray your blessing on each one as we go and let your kingdom come. Thanks for listening to this message from Shofar Christian Church. We believe that you enjoyed your time with us, establishing God's kingdom and His glory in your life. For more info, call us on 012-362-1363. Email us, pretoria at shofaronline.org. Browse our website, www.shofaronline.org. Or like us on facebook.com forward slash shofarpretoria.